So, um, as you said, I'm Ryan, PA over soccer training. So you'll see me a lot. I'll be out of the fields helping out. Um, and anytime you get an email, it'll probably be from me or Andy. Um, and this is Jake. He uh, does a lot of soccer for us. He officiates outside of here as well. So he knows what he's talking about. Um, so we kind of do this because we have a little bit more soccer experience than Andy does. And it takes a little bit off, off of Andy's plate. Um, so we're going to dive into soccer rules. The more you guys participate with us, the faster it'll go, the quicker we can get out of here. Um, so, Some basic stuff to start off with. Uh, you need your UNCW ID to play. You have to have your one card. If somebody shows up and doesn't have their one card, then we can't let them play. Um, equipment that we don't allow are hats and jewelry, so any hard build hats, like when you're wearing back there. Participants can't wear that for obvious reasons. Um, we don't want the bill to hit someone else in the head or for them to land on their hat, uh, have a hat dig into their head or anything. So. Um, closed toe shoes for obvious reasons. Some players are going to be wearing cleats out there. Sandals, flip flops aren't going to cut it if someone steps on you with a cleat. Um, athletic attire, so no jeans, khaki shorts, etc. You'll have players that might try to play with this stuff. Just kind of be visible or be vigilant to it. Um, if they have khakis or anything like that, it's on. We need you to buy athletic shorts. If you don't have any, you can't play. Um, and then we're playing at the Gazebo um, this season, which is out here um, behind the leisure pool. So if you know where the pool is, out the pool deck. So that facility that's right behind there between the rec center and the apartments back there. You know, with cleats, you can't have metal cleats. And jewelry, you can have a medical alert like just the bracelet, that's it. Right. Um, the medical alert bracelet. Um, there is one participant right now that plays a lot of intramural sports who has one. Um, so we know what it looks like. It just needs to be taped down um, with it beforehand. So she'll probably, she knows it has to be taped down, so she'll come and ask for it to get taped down or to get some tape for it. But that's the one kind of bracelet that is allowed because we need to know how to take care of them if anything were to happen to them. Um, and um, so for check-in procedure, that's mainly going to be handled by the supervisors and the support system, which is going to be us. Um, but if it ever gets like insanely busy, we may ask for one of you guys to come help us out. Basically, all we have to do is make sure that we see their one card, and it's not just you know seeing that they have a one card. We have we need to make sure that the picture on the one card matches their picture and that the name on the one card matches the name that's on the score sheet because we've had a lot of issues with people using other people's one cards to sign in to play intramural sports. And then at this stage is also where it's crucial for us to be checking for jewelry. That way we can get to it before they get to the field, before the game gets started. And that way you don't have to interrupt play so that they can take the jewelry off and you don't have to give a card to the captain because the captain didn't make sure that their teammates didn't take their jewelry off or anything like that. Uh, this is what our sign-in sheet looks like. So um, if you were helping out the sport assistant, this is the sheet they'd have you use to sign in the participants. that will already be populated with the players' names and stuff. This is just a blank example. But uh, all you need to do is see their, eight, five, or see their one card, make sure it's them, and then they can sign in, in the column where it says signature. When you give them a jersey number, you would just write their number in the side over there uh, next to where it says student ID. So, pretty straightforward and simple. You guys probably will not deal with this in all honesty. Um, very rarely, we'd have to be short staffed or something to have an official help us out with this. Um, so, uh, another thing you'll use on a nightly shift is the scorecard. This you will keep and you'll give back to the supervisor. So, the supervisor will give it to you at the beginning of your game, at the end of the game, give back to them. Um, I'm here. Uh, you're just you're going to fill out all these fields, the so date, time, which field you're on. Uh, team name and color should already be put in there in the office for you, so you don't have to worry about that, so you know which team is which. And then you'll record the scores at the end of each half. Um, total number of score, what their sportsmanship rating is. We'll hit on sportsmanship ra rating later in training. Um, and then any cards you give, yellow or red cards, indicate the player number and which one yellow or red that you gave them, and then put both of the officials' names on it, and then return it to the supervisor at the end of the game. That way... You know, like you mentioned, the daytime field and then the team name and color should all be filled out during our office shifts, so that shouldn't be something you guys have to worry about too much. That should help you guys out in setting up the field, knowing who's home, who's away, that kind of thing. Um, but it's really crucial that we get the total scores and the sportsmanship ratings. And then um, I go ahead and put the officials' names on there before you even start the game. That way, if you forget to do the total score of the sportsmanship rating, we can contact you You know, when we're closing up shop at the end of the night, or if we notice it after you leave at the end of your shift, um, we can contact you and try and get that information from you. Any questions? Two officials per game. Yeah, there will be two officials on field on the field at a time. 
We've talked about adding a th third this year, but we're going to start with two. That's what we usually do, so it should work fine. It's just a matter of number of shifts for people as to what we'll do. But we're going to start with two. That's what we usually do for and soccer. Will there be offsides? No, we'll touch on that later, but there's no offsides in our, in our league yet. So now we're going to start on the rules for our soccer. Uh, it is 7v7, and then the teams can start a game with as few as six, but if they have any fewer than six when it's game time, then uh, you will either, if the opposing team has seven or six, if the opposing team has the number of players they need to start the game, you will talk to them and see if they want to either wait 20 minutes or uh, accept the forfeit, but we'll address that later also. But you need to have six, otherwise it's gonna be considered a forfeit for that team. Um, what you're going to want to do is get the captains together for the captains meeting. You'll do a coin toss, and it's the visiting team that calls the coin toss. Obviously, we don't necessarily expect you guys to have points. I never do. So I just do like a one or a two behind my back. And then when you're doing that, just make sure you're facing the other captain. Like if the teams I had was Brian and Allie, and Allie was home, Brian was away, I would stay in between them facing Allie. I'd say one or two. That way, she can hold me accountable and make sure that I'm not going to like change it just because he called a two and changed it to a one. Um, and this entire concept of like a pre-game situation with the coin toss and all of that and the rules explanations we'll go over tomorrow when we do stations. Um, but that's just kind of a brief touch on it to start with here. Um, <coughs> more often than not, you'll get. It's, it's really a defend a goal or kickoff option. Most of the time this receive doesn't happen. I don't think it ever happens. I don't even think it's a thing in soccer. But um, kickoff, they can get the ball first. Defend a goal, they can pick which side they want. Then the other team can pick defender, what, or pick defender, get the ball first. Um, and then it'll flip for the second yeah, half. So say I won the point toss correctly, I'd say do you want ball or side? You can say whether he wants the ball first. And if he says he wants the ball first, then Ali gets to pick which side she wants to defend. Uh, so for our soccer, we'll play two 20 minute halves, um, and that'll have a five minute half time in between. So we schedule an hour for each game. If we run it all on time, it should take about 45 minutes to complete, um, which gives us a little bit of time so we can make sure we get the next one started on time. Um, if we go into overtime, it's three minutes, sudden death, golden goal. So first team to score in that three minutes wins the game. If at the end of the three minutes it's still tied, then we'll go into a penalty shootout, um, it'll be a five-person shootout. Uh, the rules vary a little bit between co-rec and men's and women's. To start with men's and women's, it's just it's just five kickers. So if you have if it's a men's game, you'll have five kickers. You'll go through those five. If it's still tied, then we'll go one and one shootout after that. And then when we have a winner, we have a winner. Now I believe we still have the same rule that the first five have to be players that were already on the field. Correct. I believe so, yes. So your first five shooters have to be players that were on the field at the end of regulation. The next, when, when after that tie, when you're going one and one, it can be anybody from your team. And, and you can duplicate a kicker from the first five. Your whole team doesn't have to kick before you use somebody again. Yeah. And then for correct the difference is it just has to alternate. Yeah, you alternate genders in correct instead of, obviously, men's and women's, when it's all men on the field, you can't alternate between men and women. But in correct, you have to alternate genders. Um, our mercy rule, 15 goals, or 15 or more goals with five minutes remaining, or 10 or more goals with two minutes remaining. So a team has to be up 15, um, which you won't see often in outdoor soccer. It's not as high scoring as indoor soccer is. But so if they're up, if they score a goal and go up 15 with four minutes and 30 seconds left in the game, then the game's over. Um, if they if they're up. 10 with 2.05 to go, and then the other team scores with 2.01 to go, and now it's a nine goal game, then we'll keep playing until the other team goes up 10 again. So it's gotta be at 10 goals with or more with two minutes or less remaining, 15 with five or less remaining. Um, and then we'll call those games, because the team's not gonna come back from those deficits. And then with soccer, well, I'm, I'm assuming most of you have some experience with soccer, but there's no timeouts. Yes, no timeouts. Uh, so with substitutions, there isn't any sort of limitation on how many times you can sub or you know anything like that. Just make sure that it's on a dead ball, and this is going to be on you guys to enforce. Talk to them at the captain's meeting and make sure that you let them know, hey, if you want to do a substitution, come to the middle of the field, 
get my attention, and then I will let you know. I will whistle you on whenever you can come in. Um, so the easiest times to do it is whenever there's a goal kick or a corner kick, and then after that, your next priority is going to be on throw-ins. Uh, obviously, it's up to your discretion if there's a run of play and the offensive team has this up ready, but they're running the play really quickly and it goes out of bounds and it's still their ball, you don't necessarily have to stop the play immediately to give them that substitution. If they want to play it quick, let them play it quick. And then if there's any injuries, first off, make sure you let us know. And then also, you can they can sub that injured player and then also the opposing team can also make a substitution at the same time. And then also, if a player gets a yellow card, they can be subbed, and then if a player is disqualified, they get a red card. The ejected player must leave. You're going to need to get our attention for that. We'll handle it from there, but they can be subbed. Pretty much summing all of this up, whenever play stops, we allow subs um, because we know that our players aren't superstars out here, most of them, um, and they're going to get tired pretty fast. So we'll allow them to sub on pretty much any dead ball. We don't care about possession. But as he said, on throw-ins or anything like that, if a team's trying to play fast, don't necessarily stop their play for a sub. But if they're just taking their time, you've got a sub waiting, let them come on. Yeah. So um, when a player gets a yellow card, they need to be subbed off. No, they don't have to come off. They can come off if the team wants them to come off to prevent a second yellow. Yeah. But this is a rule we changed last year or the year before that. Caution players don't have to come off anymore for us. So, but play is stopped at that point because you have to administer the card, write it down, so we will allow teams to make any substitutions they want at that point. Yeah. And then, um, like we were saying, it doesn't necessarily, it's not based on possession, but if, if you guys would feel more comfortable making sure that, you know, yellow subs on yellow's throw in and green subs on green's throw in, just make sure you guys address that with the captains. And the captains mean make sure you just be like, hey, it's got to be you guys are going to sub on you guys' possession. Like, just make sure everything is communicated with the captain. That's, that way there's no confusion. And then it's crucial that they have to come up to midfield and wait for your attention. Because this isn't indoor soccer where they can just sub on the fly. And this isn't hockey or anything like that. It has to be administered by you guys. And then if they continuously do substitutions without getting you guys' attention first, stop a play, administer a yellow card, to the captain or to the player that's coming onto the field, whichever, that's up to you guys. Um, and then you can restart play with the opposing team getting the ball. And then another thing that's crucial with substitutions is making sure that the player comes off the field before the player going on the field comes on. Again, if it's a super fast play, it's kind of going to be up to you guys' discretion. Just make sure that it's as close to that as possible because otherwise there's a potential for a team to get an advantage by having an extra player on the field for any short amount of time. Do we have to, we see someone standing on the sideline, we have to make the captain get us our, get the, our attention before we sub them in? No. If, if we see them, can we just sub them? If you yeah. see them and you know they want to come on, yeah. as soon as there's like a throw in or a goal kick or anything, let them come on. Yeah. Just make sure you're vocal about it. So like if there's a dead ball, and it's down on the other end of the field, and your fellow official doesn't necessarily see it, blow your whistle or yell subs and like have your hand up to make sure that the other official knows to hold the play until the sub is completed and then put your hand up. Um, so it's really up to us to decide like who can come on when. So um, honestly, what we just have to do is talk to our other official to see like if yellow can come on on green's throw. Right. Yeah, okay, so that's up to us. If you officiate outside of here, <coughs> Like, if you officiate for um, high school or club outside of what we do for intramurals, usually yellow can only sub on yellow possession, green can only sub on green possession, except for some exceptions. There's no um, but, but um, yeah, and there's no subs on those. But um, here, we just, we try to keep it as level as possible, because a lot of people don't understand those rules, um, and we keep it as basic as possible for our officials. So we allow them to sub whenever. If you want to keep it that way, to keep your game more orderly, just make sure your officials are on the same page. That way we're consistent and we're not letting yellow sub on green, but then green can't sub on yellow because we're changing. So just keep it consistent. That's why we kind of do it this way. Just to keep it consistent. It's easiest to keep consistent. So. All right, so we're going to break into cru cruise real fast. I think we have seven, eight plus alley. So we're going to have one crew, of, or let's just do two crews of four. That'll be simplest. Um, so I'm going to number off 
one, two, one, two, and then we'll break into it. So. So one's up here, two's over here with Alex. I'm gonna pull these up for you guys. Alright, so I'm pulling these up. Put your crew number and the names of everybody in your crew in that first page there. And then take a couple minutes and on the next page there should be some terms. Just define them um, or put the enforcement that you think comes with them. Um, however you want, however you see fit to whatever you think needs to be said that's important about those terms. Yeah. And if you have any questions, let us know. We'll take, let's say, let's take about seven, ten minutes to do that. Uh, do you want to introduce ourselves? I'm not going to. What happens if they do hold each other's 
start? Is it? Oh, it's Yeah. Yeah. Can I start? Yeah. 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 Yeah.
They've just been bracketed on the button. You guys get back there? Yeah, All right. So let's kind of jump into this, go over these terms. Um, so first off, we didn't have you define it because we don't have it, but there's no offside in our intramural league. Um, running two officials and only playing seven on seven, you'd be calling offsides a lot, and it's another thing we'd have to teach and in two days. It's kind of more intricate than we're willing to get with it. So, um, so I want to use this picture first. Which ones are inbounds, which ones are out of bounds? So anybody shout it out. Top one, is that in or out? In. in. All right, middle one, in, and last one, out. out. All right, so how did you guys define out of play? You got all those right, so just tell me how you, that's one of them, right, out of bounds? Yeah, how, how did we define that? Outside the line, completely outside the line. Completely outside the line, so uh, the entire ball has to be in this red area here. We won't have a red area on the field, obviously, but um, if even the smallest sliver of the ball is still on the line, then it's in play. If the smallest sliver is still on the line, on the goal line, it's not a goal because the goalie can reach back and knock it back out. But as soon as the entire ball is crossed the line, it's either out of bounds, goal, whatever you've got. And this is where your positioning is crucial because if it's an out of bounds play on the sideline, you need to be on the sideline so that you can see whether the whole of the ball is crossed the whole of the line. And then if it's a um, close play on the goal line, you need to be all the way down at the end line so that you can see whether the whole of the ball across the whole of the line, whether or not it's a goal. Crucial. All right, next one, goalkeeper restrictions. Um, go here. What do you guys have for goalkeeper restrictions as a crew? Um, we said that, let's see, they, can, they can't go outside of the 18 holding the ball. Right. Um, and then they can't receive, um, they can't handle a pass back from their own teammate unless it's from the header show. Just not from the feet. If from it's like yeah. a, yeah. a deflection off of the thigh or anywhere else. And uh, the key to that is it has to be an intentional pass back. A deflection or a mistake, not necessarily we're going to penalize them for it, but an intentional pass that the goalie then handles is technically an indirect handle. Yeah. Um, you guys have anything different? They have six seconds to play the ball. Yeah. That's the one I was really looking for with the goalkeeper restrictions. Um, so we'll touch on slide tackling later, but the goalkeepers can't dive towards a player with momentum. So they can go side to side as long as they're not taking on a player's feet, and they can't dive or slide forward with momentum to win the ball off of a player's foot. So that's the main one I was looking for there. But the other ones were all right, too. They have to be, if they're going to use their hands, they have to be inside the 18. They have six seconds to play the ball. Um, are we missing any for the goalkeepers? Those are really the main ones. But they can dive with the feet, though. As long as there's no players around, yeah. Yeah, there's yeah. nobody around. Uh, as far as defining playing the ball within the six seconds, as long as they put it down in the, at their feet or pass it out to another player, we're good. Yep. Um, but once they put it down at their feet, they can't pick it back up. Yep. Bouncing it is fine, because I know I've had somebody ask me whether they can still handle the ball if they're like bouncing it, because technically it went down to their feet, but no. Like, I'm fine with just bouncing the ball. Um, just as long as it's down at their feet, they cannot pick it back up. They can take the ball from outside the 18-yard box, bring it back with their feet, and then pick it up. As long as it's not a pass back mm -hmm. from their own team. Question. That's fine. The bouncing thing, that's still is under the six-second time limit, right? Yeah, yeah, because yeah, that counts as six seconds. the six seconds is when the ball is in their hands. So if they're bouncing the ball, that still counts as the ball being in their hands. That still counts towards their six seconds. Adding on to the six seconds, if anybody plays basketball, the six seconds for a goalkeeper is like three seconds in the lane. It's a very long and slow count, and we give the keeper time to get rid of the ball. Now, at the end of the game, we'll crack down on that if he's trying to kill time because his team's winning by a goal. That is when we'll kind of start to really enforce the six seconds. But earlier in the game, he's just trying to get a teammate open, and he's got it for six, seven seconds. We'll kind of let it go. Yeah. He gets up around 10, 11 seconds. We'll be like, all right, come on, keeper. And if he doesn't play, then he gets a yellow card for delay of game. Yeah. Did you say this? I don't know. So they can't dribble it into the box and pick it up? No. They if it's not a pass back, they can bring it they back into their box and pick it up. Yeah, that's fine. That's perfectly legal. <laughs> so uh, they can control the ball with the hands in their own penalty area. We hit that. Six seconds. 
uh, to drop, kick, punt, throw, or place the ball at their own feet. Once the ball's at their own feet, they're like a field player. They can do whatever they want with it other than pick it up again. Um, they can dribble it all the way down the field if they want. They don't have to stay in the box once the ball's at their feet. You'll probably see that. Um, they can't handle a throw-in from their own team, so that's when we didn't hit. So if team throws it into the goalie, they can't play it with their hands. They have to play it with their body or their feet that's a like a field player. Um, same thing with the back off of their feet. Um, and goalkeepers can dive but aren't allowed to take players out like sliding as yellow guard. So this is something that you're going to want to specifically talk to the keepers about before every single game. Even like, even if you want to handle it, have one referee do the captain's meeting with the captains and then the other one go talk to the teams, go talk to the goalkeepers. I make sure that I specifically talk to the goalkeepers about their restrictions because this is very different than if they were playing club or if they played high school because I want to make sure that they know that they can fall onto the ball, they can fall side to side, but they cannot gain momentum towards a player when they're going to the ground. And then I want to make sure that they know where their zone is, where they can pick it up, the fact that they can't pick up a pass back from their team, all that kind of stuff. Specifically talk to the goalkeepers about this because that's where a lot of the sources of frustration from our interview participants is going to be is with things involving the goalkeepers. Okay, so we, we talked about this as well, but if the, okay, so let's say a uh, goalkeeper and the opposing team go on a 1v1 and the goalkeeper leaves his box, he also can't use his hand. So if he goes in the slide for the ball, does the same reply? Like, Once he leaves his box, he's considered a field player. He's a field player. So as soon as he slides, it's going to be a whistle and a yellow card if he doesn't make contact and a red card if he does make contact. Okay. All right, let's breeze through these next ones because these are pretty simple soccer terms. Throw-ins, let's go you guys. How do you get a throw-in? Exactly. Both feet on the ground, ball over your head. When is it a throw-in? Which line? The sidelines. The sidelines. Alright. All right. Um, with throw-ins, a couple of things. Sorry, I know we were trying to go through it quick, but um, make sure because specifically <coughs> in Teal, you're going to get people that don't know how to do throw-ins. So. What I recommend is talking with your uh, fellow official, making sure one knows to watch the play where the ball is going, and then the other one is watching the person doing the throw-in, because in Teal you're going to get a lot of people that don't know how to do a throw-in. With the first couple of weeks in Teal, I will give them a rethrow and make sure that they know, hey, it has to go over your head, not to the side, or not with one hand, and make sure you keep both feet on the ground. First couple of weeks, that's fine to give them that. Um, after that, you're going to want to make sure that you blow it and give it to the other team because at that point, they ought to have you know, hurt us, make sure that they know the rules and stuff like that. And then with goalkeepers, you can't, or not with goalkeepers, with throw-ins, you cannot score directly from a throw-in. So if you throw it in, it touches nobody, it goes directly in the goal, it's not a goal. It's going to be brought out for a goal kick. Um, all right, so both hands equally over the head. They can't come from the side. It has to be straight over their head. Um, both feet on the ground at the time of the throw, and then this is the one part we didn't hit. If the ball never comes inbounds off of the throw, they get to rethrow it once. If it happens again, it's a turnover for the other team. And when it comes inbounds, it doesn't have to be. It comes inbound, touches inbounds, and then comes out. If it comes inbounds in the air, and then the wind takes it out, that wind inbounds. So it's technically in play at that point. And then when we talk about both feet on the ground at the time of the throw, I've seen a couple of people do it at a Greek tournament, so you might see it out here at intramurals. The flip throw, as long as their feet are on the ground, when they throw it, when they release that ball, totally fine. Uh, all right, corner kick. You said the ball is placed inside the, the arc, and you have to have a signal from the um, official to proceed with the play. Mm -hmm. If you stop play for any reason, then you'll have to blow a whistle to start it. But if the, if you didn't stop it for a substitute, then as long as the play is ready, then you don't necessarily have to blow a whistle to start that play. Anything else to add over there? Yeah, it has to be stationary. It can't be rolling, obviously. Um, when do you have a corner kick? Because I've had some confusion with um, officials on this in the past. So when is it a corner kick versus a goal kick? Depend on the team. It has to be the one to knock it out of bounds. Or right. Back. All right, so the end line that the goal sits on if the defending team is the team that it goes out of bounds off of on that end line, then the attacking team takes a corner kick going towards the goal they're trying to score in. If the attacking team is the one that puts it out over that line, 
the defending team takes a goal kick coming out from that goal going towards the goal they're attacking. Right? And then with corner kicks, it's going to be what we talked about with positioning later on tonight and then also again tomorrow. Make sure that one of the officials is going to be looking inside the box and watch the play inside the box. The other official is watching the line to make sure that the goal kick doesn't go out of bounds and then come back in. Because that will happen. And then goal kick, I kind of touched on right there. Um, it's uh, when the attacking team plays it out of bounds over that end line, take it from the six yard box, and if it doesn't clear the penalty box, yeah, it has to be re kicked. Yeah, so um, this will happen a lot. This will happen a lot. I have it happen every time I officiate in the Yeah. Uh, so make sure this is another thing you can talk to the keepers about whenever you talk to them about their restrictions. It doesn't matter where they place it inside the PK box. They can place it on the left side, on the right side. It doesn't really matter where it goes out of bounds for a goal kick. It's Andy's emails. He's getting a ton of emails um, right now. I don't know why. <laughs> but when they are kicking it, it does have to be stationary, one. And then two, it needs to leave the 18-yard box. If, you know, for the first couple weeks, again, I'm fine with giving it back to them for a re-kick. Just make sure you let them know, hey, you know, later on in the season, we're going to be calling this. You know, we're going to be strict on the rules. So just make sure that you guys understand that when you're taking a goal kick, it has to leave the 18-yard box. Um, Your email's going nuts. I know. <laughs> once we get to playoffs, it's going to be an indirect kick from that spot. Any questions about those three terms there? Yeah, what happens uh, after the second time, maybe, when they don't get it out? Yeah, so if they do it two times in a row, low dead is going to be an indirect kick from the spot. Yeah. The key is there, it's indirect. The other team doesn't get a chance to score directly off that kick, which we're yeah. about to get into, but it'll be indirect. All right, direct, indirect kicks. Uh, you guys just did the last one. Let's go back there. Direct kicks, you can score off the... And indirect kick. Someone has to touch it. Someone has to touch it. Pretty, pretty much. Um, direct, There's indirect. Two. Yeah, yeah. Um, the direct and indirect just refer to if you can score a goal directly off the kick or indirectly off the kick. Um, so direct kick, the kick, the guy who takes, guy or girl, that takes the free kick can score a goal straight off of their own foot. Indirect kick, it has to be touched by the player taking the free kick and then a teammate or opposing player before it can be counted as a goal. If the ball goes directly in, there's direct kick. If the ball goes directly in off of the indirect kick, um, without another person touching the ball, then it'll be a goal kick for the goalie. It'll be just like going out of bounds over that end line. Um, and then make sure uh, the players are 10 yards back. The attacking players have to ask for their distance though. Um, so if they don't ask for their distance, for all we know they're trying to play fast, so we don't walk it off for them. If they ask for their distance, then the free kick's on the whistle. So you'll point to, point to your whistle, say on my whistle, walk off the distance, back up, blow your whistle, let them take the kick. If you officiate any of my games, you will see this. If they don't ask for the distance, I'm going to be standing right in front of the ball. Uh, any questions about that? All right, so jumping into direct kicks a little bit more. These are the types of things that will lead to a direct kick. So any ING fouls, kicking, spitting, tripping, jumping at an opponent, charging into an opponent, striking or attempting to strike an opponent or a teammate for that matter. Um, tackling, pushing, handling, which is the technical term for handball. There's not technically a handball in soccer, it's called handling, um, and holding. So you see any of these things, direct kicks, because they're fouls automatically. Um, anything to add about those? It's pretty straightforward there. Um. <laughs> Indirect kicks for all of your ION plays, so there's dangerous plays, and then there's obstruction, which we'll define a little bit better because that one's a little complicated. Um, a caution or an ejection, and then um, for this next one, this will happen a lot in teal as well. So when you have a kickoff or a free kick or an indirect kick, the same player can touch it twice without like somebody else touching it before their second touch. So if my team has a kickoff, I can't pull it back and then play it or push it forward and then touch it again. It has to be touched by someone else. Uh, this uh, That specifically is another one of those situations where the first couple of weeks I'm a little more forgiving. I'll 
bring it back to them, let them know, hey, somebody else has to touch it before you touch it again, that kind of thing. And then a ball played back to the goalie, um, and he picks it up with his hands. That's going to be an indirect kick from where the goalie picks it up. Like we were talking about earlier with the goal kicks, if the goal kick does not go outside of the 18-yard box, it's going to be an indirect kick right from where the player received it. Uh, uh, any, any outside interference is going to be handled with an indirect kick. So if a ball from another field comes onto the field or a dog for someone who doesn't know that they have to be on their leashes, dog comes onto the field and interrupts the play, you're going to stop it and then give an indirect kick. Unless you're Jake, you'll just ignore the dog and your AR with this flag up telling you there's a dog on the field. You didn't keep interfere with play. <laughs> um, but yet, the only other thing um, with the caution player, if you give a yellow card for a trip or something, that's a direct kick because the stoppage in play came from the foul. Whereas if you caution a player away from the play, maybe he disagreed with your call, play restarted, and he's still jawing at you, you stop play, give him a yellow card, then it's indirect from there because you gave him a yellow card away from a direct play on the ball. Or like consistent investment <laughs> substitutions, that kind of thing you can give a yellow card for. Um, cards, yellow card, that's your caution. Like, all right, you've done this one too many times. Here's your warning. If you do it again, probably going to be ejected. Um, make sure that the player that's getting the card knows they're getting the card because we have a problem. If 32 on yellow gets a yellow card, doesn't see you give him the yellow card, commits another foul, gets the red card, he's like, I didn't even get a yellow card. Well, you did. You just don't know that I gave you the yellow card. So make sure that the player knows that you're giving it to them. Um, during this period, when the play is stopped, either team may sub because the play is stopped, so we're not going to prevent people from subbing at this dead ball. Um, and the restart will come on your whistle. Take your time to get everything right. You have to write it down on your, on your uh, scorecard. Um, so just, you don't have to be in a rush to get play restarted. If it's late in game and players want to go, just kind of be like, guys, i got to get this taken care of. Once, the quicker I get this taken care of, the quicker we can get this back started. But the more you interrupt me while I'm trying to write this down, the longer it's going to take for us to get started. So um, just go at your own pace so that you don't make any mistakes. Um, red card, it's one step up from the yellow card. Once this, a player gets a red card, they're ejected from the game immediately. Get a supervisor. Supervisor's got to fill out paperwork. And then we have to ask the player to leave the visual confines of the uh, facility so they will not be able to stay at the gazebo complex. So that's always fun to deal with. But if, they have to, if you have to give a red card, you have to give a red card. Um, so do it. You have it for a reason. Um, just make sure you notify a supervisor before you restart the game so yeah, that we can so take care of that. When you're making sure that the player knows that they're getting a card, make sure you get eye contact. This happened to me, I want to say last year, at indoor soccer. <coughs> a play where I thought I was getting the yellow card and another player thought he was getting the yellow card. So I subbed out because I thought I was getting a card and I didn't want to get another one. But then after the game, I talked to the official and the card was for someone else. So just make sure that you got eye contact. In reality, they both should have gotten the card, but true. Um, all right, so the next one I think is slide tackling. So how do we define slide tackling right here? You guys. Um, well, the correct slide tackle is an attempt on the ball and where the ball is touched. But, um, like, I don't know, when it's done incorrectly, it's like an attempt on the player, not the ball. Or um, where the ball just isn't hit, like it's from behind or something. More specifically for intramurals, do we allow slide tackling? No. We do not allow slide tackling. So, um, who's officiated with this before you have? What's the penalty for slide tackling? It's, um, it's from behind. It doesn't really matter if you like, make contact with your eyes or red. Mm -hmm. And if, uh, if it's with contact from anywhere else, um, it's also red, but if you start making it not from behind and you don't make contact, you see yellow. Right. Um, so for intramurals, if you play or officiate outside of here, ignore what you know about slide tackling for intramurals. Because for intramurals, we don't allow slide tackling. Um, what he said was spot on. If the player slides from the front or side and does not make contact, then they're going to get a yellow card. Um, it used to be T 
teams got one of these and it was like a team warning and the second player to do it was automatically ejected, we don't do it like that anymore. A subsequent player committing the same offense, sliding from the front or side and not making contact will get their own yellow card. Okay? So we're not ejecting somebody for the second one on a team anymore. Um, if a player slides from the front or side and makes contact with the opponent, automatic red card, um, send them to a supervisor. And then same thing with from behind, regardless of contact is made, and this is pretty consistent across most forms of soccer, if you make a bad challenge like that, uh, you're going to get a red card. Um, because from behind, you're asking to tear somebody to <coughs> yell or something like that, and we're not going to deal with that. So, um, Any questions about the slide tackle? Yep. For this slide tackle and they make contact with the ball, the player is like going forward and they trip over the ball or something. Slide tackle, slide tackle. Yeah, that so, but like that one. If it's clean or not? Yeah. Like, the, count contact. count the ball as a part of the player that's dribbling the ball. So that would be like contact with the player. Because what's going to happen is when the ball jams into their feet, the player is going to flip over, and then not everybody that's going to be playing intramural soccer knows how to avoid tackles or how to fall after a slide tackle. Somebody that's played club, high school, they know how to avoid those tackles. But somebody that hasn't, just out there for fun, doesn't know how to pr protect themselves against them. So then we could get into broken collarbones and stuff like that. That's what we're trying to eliminate. And Brian hit on that. Our biggest thing here is to make sure that we're minimal, minimalizing any possibility of injury while also maximizing you know, the amount of fun and interactivity people have with this campus. So we don't allow slide tackling for that very reason because especially with teal and sometimes even with gold, you're going to get a lot of people out there that may have never played soccer before, so they're not going to know how to avoid slide tackling or how to correctly perform a slide tackle. So we just want to cut that out completely. One other question. Um, say like, you know, goalie's out, person goes around them, shoots the ball, they slide tackle and try and kick the ball away before it goes. So that's the one exception. If there's nobody around them, so if they beat the goalie and the goalie's behind them and they're clear and they slide to keep the ball in and put it towards goal, that's fine because they're not putting another player at danger. So they're just trying to make an athletic play on the ball with nobody around them. So that's a clean play. That's fine. We're not going to penalize them for that. If they haven't beat the goalie yet and they're sliding at the end line and the goalie's right there with them, then we'll probably give them a yellow card if they don't make contact with the goalie. And be like, you got to keep your feet there. The goalie's right there. He's trying to make a play on the ball too. Yeah. Anytime they go to the ground, uh, I make sure that at some point during the next few seconds, I make sure to let the player know, hey, try and stay on your feet. Even if it's a, a clean play, I still want to make sure that they know that our goal is for them to stay on their feet. Is it uh, the same thing with defending? Can you defend and clear to try to clear? Yeah, as long as there's nobody around you, you're fine. Whether you're attacking, defending, doesn't matter. We've toyed with this rule for, it seems like, ever since I've been here. And we're never ever going to take sliding out of our game. We can't. And this is probably what drives the most people nuts in our game. Why can't I slide? We need to make sure that we say that in our captain's meeting, that keep your feet. There's somebody around, we're going to card you. That goes back to you, you need to card them. If you're not sure, like, oh, that was close from contact, no contact, yellow card. Straight up contact, see you later, you got to go. We don't want that in our game. We want to give them every opportunity to play. But what I don't want is Brian, Jake, or Ali, or one of the other supervisors coming in saying, we had to stop a game three times because X official would not give a card for us on the contact. Please don't be that official. We've had that official on staff of, I like to play physical, so I'm going to let them play. No, that's not how you're going to do it around here. If it's a foul, you've got to call. If it's marginal, I'll give you a break. Slide to the ground with somebody around, you better give out cards. Because they have the ability to stop a game and give cards, as do I. So this this rule has gone round and round between Zach, Brian, and I several times. I finally got this this year. It took me three years to get it. So we are trying to enhance and improve the rules wherever we can. All right. Uh, briefly, advantage. Who wants to tackle that? take anybody. So basically advantage is when the attacking team has the ball gets fouled but their team doesn't have to be the same player but their team remains with possession in the 
in like right after the foul. Now, if they get a foul and then lose it, like keep possession but then lose it, you know that that you can kind of call. But basically, if they just keep possession or their team keeps possession, you just let them play with it. Yeah. So with advantage, the key thing is that team maintains possession and they're moving forward with the play. If they still get the ball back, but they immediately hold the ball, that's usually signaling, okay, that was a foul. I'm waiting for you to blow your whistle. Go ahead and blow. But if they're moving forward with the play, then you don't have to uh, you don't have to blow your whistle. But do make sure you're vocal with letting everyone on the field know that you're giving advantage. So you're going to want to swing your hands up and then let them know play on or advantage. Be very vocal that way. Everyone on the field, even the ones on the sideline know that the play is continuing and they don't have to stop. And then um, my thing is I usually, you know, <clears throat> not a few seconds, you know, between three and five seconds. And if the play does not develop within that three to five seconds or the other team gets possession of the ball, or even if it's like an egregious foul, I mean, I'm going to blow my whistle and bring it back. For me, advantage, and it's completely <coughs> discretionary because you know, this is Jake said for me, and then I'm going to say it again for me. Um, it's I try to give the attacking team three dribbles or one pass. Once they complete three dribbles or a pass, I think the foul that was committed no longer is influencing play, and the advantage has been played out, and that I'm not going to call it back for that foul. Um, and that's just kind of a rule of thumb, um, and a shot too. If they take a shot and they miss a shot wide, and they turn around and yell at me, and they're like, I want my advantage. I'm like, no, you took a shot. You got your shot. You're not getting advantage. I'm not giving you another shot at it. Um, so Yeah, because think about it this way. They take the shot, and if they had scored, but we blew our whistle, they'd be pissed. So if they take the shot and miss, we gave them that chance to score because we gave advantage. But the key thing here is making sure that you're vocal so that everyone on the field knows that you're giving that advantage. Because a lot of the times, we'll have it, in, and this happens in every sport across the board. If there's a foul, a lot of the times, if it's like a recognizable foul, both teams may, you know, kind of slow down the play, and or may just completely stop. It's happened in indoor, and it kind of lost me a game. You got to play to the whistle. So, whether it's a whistle or whether you're vocally saying "play on," make sure everyone in the field knows what's going on in that situation. <coughs> Any questions about that? No. Um, some correct differences, really fast. Uh, is still seven on seven. Uh, but for Korek, we'll play uh, one to one ratio or as close as we can get. Uh, three males, three females on the field, and then the goalkeeper can be either gender. That's the easiest way to explain it so that they have the right ratio at the beginning of the game. Because um, otherwise, you'll end up with four males, two females somehow. So just tell them three males on the field, three females on the field. You get freedom over your goalkeeper. They can be male or female. Um, if the team starts down at the minimum with six, it's still three males, three females. They just pick which one they want to put in goal. So they'll end up with three and two on the field, and the other one will be in goal. If the seventh player gets there, they have to maintain the three on the field, three on the field, one in goal um, ratio. Um, and then we've already talked about correct shootouts, which I had on the sheet. But um, correct shootouts, they'll choose five players to shoot, must alternate gender. So it's the same thing as a male or female shootout, except they're alternating gender this time. If a second shootout is needed, instead of sudden death, one kicker for each team, it's another five kickers. And we will do that the entire way, and that's because that's the fairest way to ensure that they're maintaining the correct requirements to play, that they're going male, female, male, female. So, um, and after you choose the next five to go, you still have to alternate gender. They can use the same shooters as the first time, though, if they would like to. Any questions about that? Just because my team chooses to shoot three females, your team can shoot three males. And it doesn't matter which order. It matters the whatever the plus one gender is. You've got to go with that shooter first. So if I have three females and two males, the female shoots first. Versus if Ryan team has three males, the male shoots first. And the keeper can be of either gender. So the keeper doesn't have to because I have a female shooting. He doesn't have to have a female goal. So just remember that. So yes, ma'am. <coughs> can be one of the five shooters. Correct. All right, so we're going to get into some plays now, um, just kind of common violations that I've picked out off some videos. Um, so 
kind of walk through these ones and then I have some more at the end if we don't run out of time where I'll kind of let you guys kind of talk them out and make the calls and see if the call is made was right or not. But these ones are just going to talk out here. Um, so this first one here, this one I just put in there to show you how fast plays will happen. Um, it's going to replay, hopefully. Um, but how fast it'll happen, the player takes, there it is, the player takes a shot and this player right there turns to block it. He's got his hands up and inside and he's turning away, so probably not a handball. But that shows you how fast the ball could come at a player and you've got to make that split second decision. It hit him here, but he's getting himself out of the way, probably not a handball. Hits him here and he's expanding himself, not getting himself out of the way, trying to block the ball. Handball, penalty kick. But because he's kind of shying away, got his hands inside his body, probably not going to call a handball there. Plus it gets on super fast and doesn't really have time to do anything other than what he did. <laughs> All right, this one, watch the thrower when it replays. Pick that foot up. <coughs> it's what we're looking to make yeah. them not do. That's what I'm talking about when I say, you know, one official watch the play, one official watch the throw. And his, 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 his complaint would be, well, when I threw it, my foot was still there, but then it came up. We're going to extend the momentum rule there. If, he, if he's in the motion of throwing it and he's not finished throwing it and the foot comes up, then we're going to call that and go the other way with it for the other team. This one, you're also watching the thrower. Uh, Watch his arms. Uh, yep, came from the side. It's also not allowed. It's got to be two even hands over the head. Um, a lot of times players, when they get their run and start, they'll try to come from the side to get more power. They can come from the side back, but when they come over their head, it has to be straight forward over the head. They can't come from the side and then go like that because um, that's giving them more power than what the rules are allowing for throw-ins. So. This one, right there. Probably not a foul that you're going to call in the flow of play, but I just wanted to get in here and get it in here so you could see it. Because it doesn't really influence anything. But right there, pulls, pulls that shirt. So if the player wanted to make a play, he's not going to be able to go anywhere because the other player's got his shirt. He's not looking to make a play, he's looking to pass that ball. So it doesn't really influence anything. But if you were to see that, you see that shirt pull? It's prohibiting him from making a move. You could call that. Slide, slide tackle. Um, probably not a contact slide there. That one's probably a yellow card. <clears throat> she goes after the ball. So that's, that's your ambiguous gray area. I don't know if I'm necessarily going to run that player for that slide tackle. It wasn't a great slide tackle to start with, and she didn't really hit the player. Um, she did hit the ball, though. So, Andy, do you want to do you want that in the injection? That's yellow. Yeah, that's it's yellow, yellow, yellow card. Yellow. Yeah. I have a tough time defending that as a right. Uh, here. That, that's your charging penalty. We have a good one for indoor soccer. It's hard to get charging in outdoor soccer, but uh, th this one's a classic charge. And really, it's not anything malicious by that blue player there. He's trying to play the ball. He's just very late. I think he's wearing basketball shoes, so he can't stop. And comes through the player. Comes through the player. So player makes a cross. If his teammate's sitting in here, the middle taps it in the goal, let this go. But that ball gets cleared back out. Bring a free kick right there. Just clipped her heels. Just a simple foul. Um, she was running, tried to make a cutback, got clipped in the heels, brought it down from behind. Uh, Matt Legink, I believe, is right on top of that. So. All right, so sportsmanship ratings, which I said we'd get back to. Do you want to cover sportsmanship, Jake? Sure. 
So sportsmanship for us is going to be graded on a scale from one to five, one being the lowest, they were terrible, you probably had to stop the game early, there was multiple ejections, that kind of thing. Five being the best, they you know basically called their own fouls, handed the other team the ball, and was like, I apologize for that, sir. Here you go. Um, so most of the time you're going to get in the three to four range. For them to make it into playoffs, they have to maintain a three or better. Uh, if there's anything lower than a three, we need to have some sort of card. We need to have multiple cards given for it to be a two or worse. And then we need to make sure there's documentation about like you know why we're giving a two because we want our players, we want our teams to be able to go further and further into playoffs, and we want to have more competition. So if we're going to do something that's going to prevent them from going into playoffs, we need to be able to explain it to the team captain and to our officials and to our supervisors. So if you're going to give it to, there needs to be cards and you need to be able to explain it to us. And then make sure you guys do this as soon as the game is over. It's not like in other sports where you have to go tell um, somebody or one of the sport assistants immediately. This is right there on your scorecard. So go ahead and handle that as soon as the game is over. Write down the final score, write down the sportsmanship rating, and then you can go hand it in to the uh, sport assistant or the supervisor that's out, either out there at the field or out there at the gazebo right there. If this is made, missing off of your game, you'll probably get a phone call from Andy at like 9 in the morning and he'll wake you up and you won't be happy, but he'll do it. He's done yeah, this to me before, so. Who is this? <laughs> yeah, I get those phone calls. <laughs> Um, here's a breakdown as to, Jake already hit it, but as to what constitutes a 5, 4, 3, 2, or 1. Um, if you're getting into the 2 or 1 range, as Jake said, there needs to be multiple cards. Not just multiple cards, but you have to have an ejection to go as low as a 2. A 1, several ejections, probably stop the game. Um, we, don't all, we don't get a lot of these, but they do happen every once in a while. So. My biggest thing with a 2, you said you need an ejection, not necessarily... A two means you give that person a card for conduct, that person a card, that person, and that person a card for conduct. Now, you're supposed to write your cards down, but who got what and for what reason? On sports mic's easy. Number 12, you see. On sports mic conduct. Number 13, sliding. Whatever, whatever, whatever. The biggest part on a two is you need documentation. Because if I call you or Zach the next morning, you go, I don't remember. Guess what? I gotta bump that up to a three. You need to fill this out before you leave. Not the next day, not in two days, that night. And then I get on these guys and girls that if it's not done, why didn't they finish it? So, if you have it, fill it out. We're not gonna be like, that was a bad, that was bad uh, sportsmanship. We're gonna discredit you and give them a three. No. You give them a two, there's a reason you gave them a two. Fill me in. You still may get that phone call from me because I need, may need more clarification. So if you get that phone call from me, I'm like, all right, walk me through this. This happened, then this, then this, then this, which led to me ejecting the player and giving them a two. Perfect, thank you. A lot of times when there's an ejection, the more detail you have, the better. Slide tackle, make contact. I can live without a slide tackle. Ryan said, F you, you're the worst effing official I know, and you can go F off. And then punch the player in the face. <laughs> that's fine. Yeah, I, that's, that's good detail right there. So give as much as you can on those. And then what he's talking about like with con a conduct foul versus a non-conduct card is basically non-conduct card would basically what we're talking about with like incorrect substitutions, that kind of thing. Conduct foul is like, you know, slide tackling, that kind of thing. Just for clarification. And it, these are important ratings too. They're important for the teams, not just for us, because um, they have to maintain three. a three to make playoffs. And then past that, we had a team come into the office today wondering what the tiebreaker procedure was for seeding in playoffs because they had a tie with the other team in their division. The tiebreaker is right here, higher sportsmanship rating. And according to Laura, that's what it is. Um, and that was the difference between them getting a buy in the first round or having to play a first round game. So that's why this is pretty important because we do use the sportsmanship rating for our teams, um, not just for our stats or whatever. So, yeah. um, handling conflict. Uh, so you'll have to deal with conflict as an official. It's just part of the job. So 
know what the player's upset about. If they're mad about a call and they're not personally attacking you, leave it alone. Um, if they're just saying, like, that's horrible, that's fine. You can disagree with my call, that's fine. But the minute they start coming after you and using profane language to do it, um, that's when you're going to start having an issue and you're going to have to address some of the conflict. Um, and if they're baiting an opponent, you have to address that quickly because we don't want fights or anything out on the field. So um, here are some steps for you. A uh, quiet word. This player misses a shot, says a word under his breath that he probably shouldn't be saying on the soccer field, but he's just upset at himself, not upset at anybody else or anything. Maybe as he's coming by, you, say, hey, man, watch your language for me. And be like, all right, my bad, my bad. Um, but... That's, that's as simple as that one. You don't want to do this in front of everybody else for everybody to hear it because then it's like you're making a scene out of something that really shouldn't be a scene. Public warning. It's when you want to make a scene because you've been getting it from this player all game long. He's been on you or the uh, entire team has been on you. Just give them the that's enough so they know you're not taking any more of it. And you give them this and they do it again. That's probably when you'll go to your yellow card because you've given them the, the warning. You don't want to as it's down here, you don't want to draw your line in sand because then you erase it, back it up, all right, here's my new line. Put it in concrete, they cross it, give them a card, whatever you got to do. Uh, captain's meeting, do this early, not late in the game. If you do it late in the game, the teams aren't going to change their behavior. But if early in the game you can tell right away you're going to have problems with these teams, get the captains together. Say, I need you guys to help me out with your teams. You need to control your team, you need to control your team, or I'm going to have to give out a lot of cards. So have the captains help you out. But, like I said, do it early, before halftime. If it's after halftime, the captain's meeting isn't going to work. The teams aren't going to want to calm down for you. Um, yellow card is part of your toolbox. You use it. It's a caution. Nobody's going to get disqualified for your accumulation of yellow cards. We don't track those. So if you've got to use a yellow card, use it. Uh, red card, last resort. But if someone crosses the line, you've got to send them um, because we just cannot have players that are going to constantly try to cause trouble out there. Um, so the supervisors will deal with that, but at, all you've got to do is give them the red card send them to the supervisor. Um, and don't make threats, because as soon as you say one more word and you're gone, they're going to say word, and then you've got to send them for saying word, and you don't want to do that. So that just gets into a whole lot of mess, because then, then it's going to come to Andy's desk, and you're be like, why was I ejected? I said word. <laughs> then he's got to deal with that, so we're not going to do that. I will not suspend them. <laughs> So right. one last thing with handling conflict, and this has really been brought to our attention specifically this year, if any of you guys feel personally threatened or offended by something that a participant or a spectator has stated, immediately come talk to us. Because, you know, some things happen and that should not be allowed on our campus. So definitely feel free to come talk to us, even if it's, even if you don't feel co comfortable talking to us immediately, come talk to us at the end of the game, because that's something that we need to handle and we need to cut out as soon as possible. Okay. I've had official or I've had spectators, as I'm running by, be like, "I'll remember you. I'll see you after the game." I personally didn't feel like that was much of a threat because I'm not worried about it, but. At the same time, still let my supervisor know because, you know, that's not cool. Yeah. Um, we'll dive into positioning. Try to breeze through this really fast because positioning for soccer is really not that difficult at all. And then hopefully get a couple more plays before we have to jump into bloodborne pathogens training. Um, so, lead and trail. Uh, lead, exactly what it says. You're ahead of the play. You're leading the play. You're responsible for the sideline you're standing on and the end line that you're going towards. Um, you'll determine if a goal counts. That's why it's important to get all the way down to the end line so you can see if the ball crosses that line completely like we talked about earlier. And then you're primarily responsible for penalties inside the box. So if there's a foul inside the box, we don't want the trail who's 30 yards that way calling a penalty unless they've got a heck of a line of sight at, the, at it. That's where the lead's gonna probably wanna call that. Um, trail, trailing the play, obviously. Um, you're watching all of the behind stuff, so try to get yourself in a position where you can see the players, the ball from behind, where you're not obstructed. Um, you're responsible for the sideline and the opposite end line, so um, I don't know why anything had happened at the opposite end line while you're trail, but if it were, it's yours down there. Um, and then you'll start all kickoffs with a whistle. So all kickoffs are started by trail, because lead needs to be focused because the ball is about to come towards them. 
Um, this changes all game long. They go one way, your partner's lead. They come back towards you, your lead. They switch your trail. It's all game long, you're switching back and forth. So you need to know both of the responsibilities as far as the coverage goes, because you'll be doing them both all game long without realizing that you're doing that. Yeah, and then this is where it comes into play to be you know, conscious of whether or not you're ball washing or whether or not you're paying attention to your zone. Because if you're the lead, you need to be paying attention to what's happening on the ball, what's happening going towards goal. If you're the trail, you need to be paying attention to everything else that's going on away from the ball. Because there can be some fouls that happen off of the ball and the lead may not catch that because he's trying to focus on what's happening on the ball to make sure nobody tries to slide tackle the person with the ball or anything like that. So when you're trailed, make sure that you're watching everything else so that if, say, I was going down the field with the ball and then Ryan's on my team and he has a defender on him, he's running alongside me, and so he shoves the defender away so that I can cross it to him. If both officials are watching the ball, they're not going to see that shove and nobody's going to call it questions about that. Here are some diagrams to show just what we're talking about. The ball is going this way. So this is lead up here in front, trail behind. Trail would blow this kickoff and they would take off towards lead. Lead starts about halfway down the field on kickoffs. Trail's right here at midfield because theoretically the ball should go this way and the trail will be in position to move up behind it. Lead can get to the end line if they need to. Um, areas of coverage on the kickoff trail has all of this blue area because that's what they're closest to. Obviously the sideline that they're on, this opposite end line, lead, sideline they're on, this opposite end line. Uh, really the field is just divided in half there. Um, pretty easy. Goal kick trail has this area. He'll want to position, he or she will want to position himself at the edge of the 18 to see if the ball comes out of the box completely. Um, lead just past midfield. Um, this gray area once the ball is kicked and you know it's coming out of the 18, trail can look here. Lead will probably be looking here the entire time. This is the ambiguous gray area, which is where anybody can see something. Watch the players and not the ball. The ball is never going to commit the foul. It'll be the players that commit the foul. So if the ball is way up in the air, watch the players that are about to jump for the ball because that's where the shove's going to occur or something. Um, any questions about goal kick coverage? No. This would be the kind of the same thing uh, about like throw and like where the lead probably would look at the ball and then the trail would probably look at everything around. Well, with throw ins, what I mostly try and do is make sure that the lead is watching where the ball is going, like the play going forward, and then I have the trail watch the thrower. That way, if once the ball's going this way, I'm not going to be looking to see if his foot's lifted up. That can be the trail. Um, corner kicks. Uh, lead is going to be positioned up here off of the end line so that once the ball is kicked they're looking straight down the goal line to see if that ball ends up in the goal or not all of, all of the way. Trail right here at the top of the box. So you're coming all the way up here to help on these goal kicks so that we have enough coverage because there's going to be a lot of players in this gray box here and we've got to see all of them. So trail's looking in there, lead's looking in there, lead's also looking to see if the play counts, any fouls that happen in here. Hopefully somebody gets them because we've got two people within 10 yards of all of the action. So, penalty go, kicks. Go back, go back one slide. Yeah. Where don't I want that lead? Where? Where at behind the ball? On the end line. On the end line and up the field. Why not? Exactly. You want to really make me mad? Stand about the 18, or in our case, it'll be the 13. Stand about there. Sure way to get yourself off the schedule for next week. That tells me you're being lazy and not hustling. The field's 100 yards. You have to cover 60 to 65 yards of it. It's not that hard to do. These two and Allie have done that for a couple years now. They, they've worked hard for where they are. So just don't get lazy on it. Because if the ball goes the other way, guess who's, got the, who, guess who's ahead of it? The trail. And then you have to come up on the backside. So just don't be lazy on that. Yeah, and this this is exactly where we expect you to be on like come the end of every attacking play. We need you on this line so that you can see whether or not it's a goal. It's not somewhere you only are for a corner kick or a PK. You need to be coming all the way down here every play. Um, penalty kicks. Lead is responsible for the administration of the penalty kick. They're watching the line to make sure that the goalie doesn't come off the line before the ball is kicked. Also to make sure the ball goes in the goal. Um, 
So they've got that. They'll blow the whistle to start the play. Trail is watching everything back here. Not going to be much going on back there, but if there were, that's theirs. And then they're also mainly watching this, the 18 here, because if anybody enters before the ball is kicked, if it's on the kicking team, then it's turnover. If it's on the defensive team, they enter before it's kicked, and the kicker misses, it's a re-kick. So they're watching that line to make sure there's no infraction there. Leeds watching this line to make sure there's no infraction here with the goalie and to make sure the ball goes in. And then um, the lead will start it because the leads will be one watching the goal, so they need to be ready for the ball to come towards them. Um, so they'll start it, and the kicker can't go before the whistle. They do. It's technically a yellow card. I would just make it a turnover. But. And then specifically talk to the keeper, make sure they know they have to stay on their line. And then before you administer the kick, just like goalkeeper, you ready, kicker, you ready. Make sure your other official is ready before you start that play. Because these are like crucial elements of the game, is PKs. Uh, throw ins, as we talked about. Lead, if the ball is going this way. As lead, I like to watch what's going to happen up here ahead of me. I'm also typically watching the thrower's hands. That way I can track the ball out of his hands and see where it's going and track those players. And I can catch up on a throwing infraction high, whereas my trail should be watching the feet. They'll pick up the low throw <coughs> infraction, and then they've got a, a foot infraction on the line or any of the players back here. Uh, throw in the other way, same, same coverage. Lead up here, trail back here, covering the same areas. Go back to throw ins. So this is the kind of, go to the next. This is the kind of situation, the positioning that we want you to have pretty much all game. Boxing the play in between your two officials. And you see how the lead is not necessarily all the way on the end of the line over there. He comes in a little bit. Don't be afraid to come in off of that end line or off of the touch line. And then just make sure that you guys are keeping the play between you guys. And then, you know, occasionally there's going to be situations where it's going to be played right on there. Just make sure that you're able to see you're not like leaning. Andy hates that. Yeah. If you're leaning, that just as easily means you could take a step to the side and see the play. As officials, try to keep like this L shape so that you can imagine another L going this way, then you've got all the play boxed in. Um, if the trail is down here looking straight across the 18 at the lead, we've got a problem. That, that should never be happening. But just if you've got this little angle here, you can look diagonally through the player, see your lead. You've probably got it boxed in right. So that's what we're going for. And this one, just a little breakdown of the ball moving and how we want the officials to move. Ball goes down, lead goes down, comes back the other way. This is now the lead down here. Um, that's pretty much what you'll be doing all game long. Um, we got video breakdown, but we got to go into Blood Bowl path. Into the thing, so. All right. So. Turn it off.